Welcome to the Last in Line podcast, where we discuss faith, hope, and truth in the lives of amazing servant leaders. You are in the right place if you crave purpose and if you hunger for a life of significance. This podcast applies biblical truth to our daily lives, and we pray that you walk away encouraged and inspired. This is the Last in Line podcast. Gentlemen, I've got a treat for you today. In fact, it's a unique Part one of two special episodes, special edition that I'm bringing to the audience. Something last in line leadership's never done, and something that I don't know has been ever done in the past. But partnering with Matt Boudreau, many of you know he and Tim Kennedy co founded the Apogee Strong Academy, which is an education curriculum, supplemental uh, education format for young men, they actually are going to be doing schools for young women and then they're doing adults for men. Um, It is just a, it's an add on to their current education curriculum, but it's unique. And I have been a big supporter of that and finally reached out to Matt and proposed something to help these guys. And he handpicked a few So this is going to be a part one of two. You're going to get two separate interviews on this one interview. I've got a Mr. Benaya Carpenter and a Mr. Malachi Duncan, who are teenagers who have been in the Apogee Strong program for between two and four years uh, each. And they have a very mature outlook. Their perspective is like no other teenager that you may have heard before which tells me this curriculum and this this academy of apogee strong is actually producing quality output and outcomes and building young men so i'm excited we put them through a mock interview so it's two separate interviews they're not on here together but you're going to get the full interview of one and then you're going to get an intermission and then a full interview of another one on this episode But I encourage you to listen at the maturity, the humility, and just the articulation from these young people. This should encourage you as to where our next generation is going. And the more of these Apogee Academies we can open and we can facilitate, the better. The more people we can get in that program, the better. And you will will see evidence of that. So I hope you enjoy this. Again, it's a unique episode coming from the mouths of babes actually teenagers but you're going to appreciate some of their answers to my questions and you're going to be surprised that they are only teenagers and then you're going to hear them go through the grinder of my mock job interview so i hope you enjoy welcome the two first two men from apogee strong program benaya carpenter and malachi duncan to last in line podcast Benaya Carpenter, I hope I pronounced it right, but welcome to Last in Line Podcast, first ever interview of the Apogee Program uh, students. So welcome aboard, man. Thank you so much for having me. And you did get my name right, which is, that's That's rare, that's a rare occurrence. So good job. Cool, man. All right. Well, I got a point for me. uh, So we need to start getting some points in your column here. No. uh, So Matt's told me Matt Boudreaux has told me a lot about you guys. I know a little bit about the program. The listeners that we have are Christian men. Um, I would say between probably 35 and 60 years old. Uh, so this is going to be encouraging for my listeners to hear the next generation of leaders and people like yourself who are being prepared, being educated and shown certain things, values, um, standards by which to live. And it's going to be encouraging for us old guys. So thanks for doing this. Um, Man, I want the audience to get to know you a little bit. So maybe just kind of maybe a high level, basic stuff. Let's talk about maybe just kind of your age, uh, maybe where you live, if you have any siblings, um, sports, hobbies, organizations that you're a part of. Sounds fantastic. And first off, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. It's a uh, it's a great opportunity, and uh, I hope I don't take it for for granted. So thank no. you. Thanks. Um, 
So I'm 16 years old. I live in a small town where there, there's a lot of those in Wyoming, but I live in a small town in Wyoming. And I have I have four younger siblings. I'm the oldest of five. Um, my family and I are all Christians. I grew up in a Christian household. So it's uh, that that's been ingrained in me from a young age. And actually, my name, if you go into the Bible and you look it up, Benaiah is uh, in, in Hebrew. It means Yahweh has built up. Mm. And that was put on my dad's heart while I was in my mom's tummy and she was about ready to pop. And he was like, I have a name. So that's where, uh, that's where my name came from. Um, but yeah, I live in Upton, Wyoming. I play basketball at our local high school. I'm homeschooled, but in Wyoming, we have a law where, where homeschoolers can play in public school or attend in public yeah. school sports. So I play basketball. Um, I, I'm just getting back into doing some mixed martial arts stuff. So all the jujitsu, the kickboxing, a little bit of wrestling. And I'm really enjoying that. It, it's been a long time since I've, since I've had a community like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. I, I, I think, I mean, I know that physical, I don't know, fitness slash defense is probably part of the Apogee. Like that's part of one of their main models and pillars is just so you guys can be physically capable young men. And, uh, yeah, I grew up in a long line of wrestlers. I wish I had, I did it for probably middle school a little bit and I wish I'd have stuck with it, but I knew enough wrestlers in high school and college that we, I mean, I guess I know enough to be somewhat get myself in a, in a, in a bad situation probably, but, um, no, uh, all right. So, homeschool i've got i've got two kids that are homeschooled two of my two older ones actually went to public school and then we kind of woke up saw the light and uh been homeschooling my two younger ones for about six years but um all right cool i you're 16 man you seem a lot older i'm sure you hear that a lot but um seem like you you know how to carry yourself and and uh articulate so here's what we're gonna do and for the listeners like you guys know how this goes when i normally have just kind of a regular old man guest will say uh we do what i call a life sentence and okay. you're no different we're not going to we're not going to take it easy on you so it's a life sentence i'm going to give you a sentence and it's going to be from your perspective and you're going to finish the sentence okay from based on your experiences if it doesn't apply to you yet then just tell me well i haven't had a whole lot of opportunities there or experience there but if you want to take a stab at it go right ahead but we're going to go for it what do you say Sounds great. Let's do All it. All right, man. Here we go. This is you talking, so you finish the sentence. The thing I'm starting to learn most about leadership is? It, it'd be, for me personally, it'd probably be, like, don't get arrogant about being a, a leader. Because ever since I was a little kid, people have, have complimented me on being a good leader. And, like, I never really had to do a lot to, I suppose, take the initiative and lead others. So I, I'll get in my head and be like, you know, like, I know what I'm doing. I'm a leader because everybody tells me I'm a leader. So I don't need to read the books. I don't need to do all the other things to hone that skill. So I think, I think that's a, I think that's a young man um, problem mm -hmm. as well. Just like mm -hmm. a little arrogant. So trying to stay down to earth and be humble about like, I don't know anything. I'm 16 years old. I haven't, I don't have as many years as you do under your belt. Yeah. You know, so I'm still trying different things. I'm still learning, but I'd say the biggest thing I'm working on right now is trying to stay humble. Um, like, like what Jocko says, you're either humble or you get humbled. That's right. Yeah, it's good. Uh, well just, you know, spoiler alert when you get to be, 50 uh or 51 you should always stay humble like you never know everything like leadership i've been doing it for a long time i've been a parent i've been in corporate america still man even if i'm considered a leader i still want to think of myself as yeah i'm a leader but man i got so much to learn so i mean you could it can be both you can be you can say yeah you know what i'm a decent leader but i got a long way to go and so that probably that should never leave you hopefully but all right. That was good. You did really good. Uh, you sure you're 16? You sure you're 16? Okay. Last time I checked my birth certificate. All right. Here we go. Here's another one. Okay. Um, 
how long so before I read it, how long have you been in Apogee? For through three years. Three years. Got it. Cool. Yep. This will work then. Okay. Here's you talking. What I would tell anyone considering the Apogee program is when I joined the program, like I I was really I didn't have any confidence in myself. I was I didn't have any confidence in myself. I couldn't hold a conversation with people. I was I never considered myself uh capable of different things. I didn't have as much responsibility. So I would tell what I would tell my peers is you need to do it. If you want to become better, you need to do it because it provides you with a brotherhood, provides you with accountability partners, and it gives you a mission. It gives you a mission of like, here's, here's all, here's all the directions you need, but it's on you to, to take hold of those directions, to read them and then go apply them in your life. And then you'll get the end result uh, at the mm -hmm. end of that, those 12 months, you'll get to see the change. And I'll be like, wow, that was way worth it. It's interesting because when you hang out with these guys from the Apogee Strong program, like I'm, I consider myself the bottom of the totem pole on the Apogee Strong mm -hmm. like program, just because the guys we have are phenomenal. All the, all the young men are way cooler than me. Um, so when you, it's pretty easy to pick out guys who'd be like, that would be a perfect Apogee guy. Like he would do great in that program. And then mm -hmm. there's guys, who, I'm not so sure. I don't think so. But mm -hmm. the same thing is like that person who you doubt could also become a stud leader. They just need the, they just need the brotherhood, the accountability. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. No, I like it. Um, man, kind of wish I to, could go back and do it over again. Uh, all right, uh, let's try this one here. And and so shirt says Hope Dealer on it. I got to give a shout out to one of my partners for my podcast, uh, Rock Bottom Hope. And they are out there helping people who are recovering addicts and they're giving people uh, a resource, a, a voice, giving them uh, good, you know, Christian counseling. So wanted to give a shout out to Rock Bottom Hope. All right, well, you passed with flying colors though. That wasn't too bad. Right. We kind of loosen the, the strings a little. And, uh, so tell me kind of, I know there's a lot to go into about the Apogee strong program and the curriculum and different parts of the program. Right. I know there's a lot of branches to that tree. What, what were some of the goals and expectations that you had coming into it? I know they probably explained a lot to you, but, about yourself, maybe, let's just say, what were you kind of hoping to see? You mentioned confidence earlier. Maybe that's the same answer, but anything else come to mind that you thought this, this could help me with this? When I went through, I think I was, I was just hoping that I would get to meet some friends mm. personally. I don't even think it was personal development. And then once I was around other people, uh, you probably heard it, but the the saying "you're only as good as the the five closest people around you." Mm -hmm. Like when I got to be immersed in with this crowd of stellar human beings, it was it was uplifting to me to become or to want to become a, a better human being. So I was like, well, like if I want to fit in with this guy or if I want to be friends with this guy, then I need to become better. So that's where most of the driving motivation came from. I think when I started, it was like, I wasn't that great with communication and I'm still like, if my dad ever listens to this, he's probably going to laugh that I said this, but I'm still, I think I'm a lot better at communicating than I was uh, back when I first started the program because I realized how valuable it was, especially since everything was virtual. It was like, if you, if you screwed up the times on an email and you wanted to get on a call with a mentor or a buddy, then so you so you had to develop good communication skills and i think one of the biggest things was probably self awareness because i was i was kind of self like i didn't have any self awareness before the program but once i got through i was i started like reading people i was i was like all right well this person i think needs this to get them motivated to do to accomplish this thing we're trying to accomplish mm -hmm. so yeah. I'd say self-awareness and communication were probably the two biggest things that I've seen over the course of three years, like development, that and discipline. 
That's great. No, I, I didn't know you then, but I mean, I think you're doing okay on the verbal communication for sure. Uh, you're, you're doing okay. I think you're doing well. Um, Thank you. well, so did any part stretch you like, let's say, so the, over the three years, I know there's a lot to pick from and you probably can't pick just one thing, but was there an area you got stretched where you were like super uncomfortable and tell me kind of how you coped and went, got through and got through the other side of that? Um, the, the toughest challenge that I think Apogee had for me, at least the, the one that I looked at was like, Oh no, this is not going to yeah. be good. Like I'm yeah. scared of this <laughs> was the, the stand up and speak challenge. And that required you to get up in front of a crowd of people and to give a speech on something. I think the, the uh, suggested thing was why I want to be a, a good leader yeah. in today's society. And backtrack a little bit, I had gotten, I went to an event with my mom and my grandma and it was around human trafficking awareness. Mm -hmm. so I went to this event and I had no idea human trafficking existed. So after that event, I was fired up and I still mm -hmm. am today. Like I want to bring awareness to the fact that human trafficking is real. Mm -hmm. So I went to my parents and was like, I have this idea. Like I want to, I want to do a speech for my youth group about human trafficking awareness and human trafficking awareness, uh, making a speech around that is pretty uncomfortable. And then getting up in front of a bunch of peers and trying to communicate to them and tell them why it's such a big deal is also pretty difficult. So I, I'd say that was probably the toughest challenge I had in Apogee where it was like, I'm going to pass out on stage. Like I'm going to, I'm going to end up dying up here. This isn't good. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, welcome to uh, the world of the biggest fear in anybody is public speaking. So regardless of age, so I can imagine as, I mean, your age and, and having to come up, get up and do that. I mean, some guys your age are just kind of fearless and ignorance is bliss, right? But it sounds like you're pretty like aware and cognitively you're like super locked in on your surroundings and what you're about to embark on. and. And so you, it was not unclear to you that you were nervous. So do you have any advice to incoming students? Like if you had a, a new group coming in tomorrow and you had to, of course, stand in front of them and deliver a message, you'd be nervous. But uh, what what's advice, something kind of simple you could say to them? Like nothing is an accident and fire aim ready. Those are the two big things that Matt emphasizes. I don't know if he talked about that while he was on your show. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you, so you've heard, uh, the fire aim ready speech yep. and broke it down for you. Yeah. So that's, that's been ingrained in my head since like day one of the program. So I'd say like nothing is an accident. Don't Perfect. be afraid to try things. And once you try something, you can figure out like, well, that did not work. Or I, I hated that. And I don't want to do that. Or I love that. And you can fix your sights. So that's good. I like it. I, yeah, just, just do it, man. Cause we can talk so many talk ourselves out of so many things and give so many reasons why we maybe shouldn't, or it's not the best thing, or just get out there and take calculated risks. Um, all right. So we're going to do what I promised. We're going to do a little mock job interview. Now, I, for some reason, I don't know why I, I just, you know, what happens when you make assumptions, right? It, so uh, it makes a ass out of you and me. And, and so I, I assumed that you that you were like I don't know eighteen nineteen and and you act like it but you're sixteen so of course you may not be having a whole lot of job interviews tomorrow but just kind of an idea I've been in management before I've been in leadership in corporate America um, I I'm not currently but I have led small groups of in different sectors so I kind of know what both sides of the desk and the interview process is about. Uh, so I'm going to give you just some very basic, simple stuff. And I just kind of want you to, I mean, you're selling yourself, right? That's the whole point of a job interview. And imagine that there's 20 other people for the same job. So, um, all right. So you come in and and you don't really have to know anything about the details of the job. Like, I, let's just say we're hiring you for a customer service slash marketing inside, you know, in an office, on the phone, that kind of stuff. Basic okay. stuff, entry level stuff. All right. So, Benaya, I just want you to, you know, we ask everybody this question. So I want you to rank these three things in order of what's most important to you. Okay. So money, 
time off uh, and then like respect or recognition from your boss or your coworkers. So that's, those are three things, time off, money or income or whatever you want to say, and then recognition slash respect of the people you work with. Yeah. If this is, if this is my dream job, then the money doesn't like even really come to okay. mind. If, if cool. it's enough to just get me by, if it's okay. enough to, to get my family by. I'd, I'd probably say the recognition and respect from the people I work with, because I want to be working in a really fun work environment with really cool people. And mm -hmm. then probably time off. Time off. Okay. Be with my family. Cool. Okay. All right. That's good, man. I mean, that, that question got asked to me in one of my first interviews coming out of college. And that was eons ago. Uh, and I don't know why I still remember it, but, I just, I, I said the same thing, like recognition of my peers to this day. And, and so when you say your intern may change in a couple of years, I don't know if it will, because still 30 years later, I, you know, 25 years later, I, I still want that. Like, and maybe because my love language, I don't know if you know that book, love language, the five love language, but my mm -hmm. love language is words of affirmation. So my yep. boss telling me good job, coworkers, like respect, like that still ranks right up there. Money, of course, having four kids is right a close second. Um, yeah. cause I, I do like to have, you know, resources, you know, surplus resources that you can do more good with it even. So, all right. Very cool. Well, I mean, as you know, in our interview, Benaya, that, you know, we're looking for that person that's kind of got that edge, that it factor, um, maybe something that separates you. So, why you like, why would we pick you out of these 20 people? What's your it factor? And then how will that benefit pretty much? I don't know any organization, but for sure, our organization. I think it'd be, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to become better. I'm trying to learn how to become a, a better person. And for this position in particular, I'm not afraid to receive feedback mm. on and I hear something you did right. Here's something you did wrong. Or maybe if it's, but I hear something you did wrong and I get that every day, I'm going to take those little pieces of nuggets and I'm going to try and, uh, better myself. Yeah. So that way I can be, um, a, a better operator in this position. That's great. Yeah. We need those because some people, of course, even if they don't think they know it all are very hard to coach and, uh, very, I guess, non-receptive to feedback. So it's good to hear. All right. I got one scenario for you before I let you go. So here we go. Here's a scenario. I want to know how you would handle this in a work environment. Um, so me being your manager, let's say if you get the job, I'm going to put you with another person and you guys are going to do, you're going to take the lead on a group project. Okay. To motivate the team or whatever the project is. That's, that's not important, but you disagree though with your person that you're taking the lead with on the best methods of how to roll this out to the team. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question would be, how do you resolve that? How do you address it? And then if there's conflict that arises, what's your best way to resolve conflict? Not don't I, calm myself down. Like, don't get emotional in the moment calm myself down it's like hey is there any is there any middle ground where we can meet and maybe combine both ideas and come up with a with a fairly similar approach mm -hmm. and if that doesn't work my it, it's just easier to just be like okay all right well i'm here to support you and i think my dad's been a good example with that because of his bosses he's had really good bosses and really not so great bosses and with his not so great bosses, he'll tell us, he's like, yeah, I was telling him, hey, can we come together and get a good plan together? And if the bad boss is like, no, screw you, do what I say. He's like, all right, okay, all right, we're going to do what you say. And then all the blame or all the the praise will be on you. So yeah. I, I think it'd be, I think it'd be easier to just let that slide than start a World War Three over yeah, um, over a, yeah. a business plan or something. Okay. Yeah. I just was curious uh, because, you know, there are times where you guys will not see eye to eye and, and I definitely don't want to be brought in the middle of every disagreement. So that's part of why we're paying you guys to, to figure it out on your own together and, 
come to a middle ground. So I, I like that answer. Okay. But I, you're off the hook, man. Uh, that was your interview. That was your job. interview. That was good. Uh, what'd you think? What'd you think of that? I think it was kind of eye opening to maybe my lack of experience. I well, that, I mean, I don't think it came across super like you were super inexperienced, honestly. I mean, you, even when you didn't know, you didn't slunch, you didn't like body language is big. So you didn't like look down, you didn't like look defeated. You always looked like you were in the game. So, I mean, even when you didn't have an answer, you were smart enough to go, hey, I'm not going to make something up and nothing's coming to mind right now. So, I mean, that I think as a manager, I would want to hear that more than I would want to hear you try to BS me or, you know, make something up. So, I mean, that's, that's good. So even when you think you may not be doing <laughs> as good as you want, like it's all about how you appear to be on the outside. Okay. So body language, and I'm not here to try to tell you how to interview. Uh, but, but I mean, that's just my two cents it, that I thought you handled that well, even when you didn't know the perfect answer. So, man, that's all, uh, that's all I have for you, man, on this, on this podcast. Um, I, I, I enjoyed it, man. I really did. It was good to get to know you. It's good to hear your perspective on leadership and kind of yourself and what you want to work on and why Apogee Strong has been so powerful in your life. Um, dude, you are on a great track. Take it from an old guy. Like, you're 16. I'm encouraged. If all 16-year-olds in this program are like you, I'm encouraged. Like, let's get more of you guys going. Let's get Let's open Apogee programs all over the place. Um, so I, I appreciate it, dude. It's been a good meet you audience. He has been Benaya Carpenter. We've been last in line. Be blessed. Yes. Mr. Malachi Duncan. Welcome to the show. I appreciate it, sir. I appreciate you having me here. Well, uh, Malachi Duncan already has bonus points because my son's first name is Duncan and your last name is Duncan and he spells it the same as yours. And so you've got a leg up on everybody. Um, Heck yeah, yeah, he sounds like a cool kid. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah. Um, and we hear good things about you too. So Matt Baudreau and I have become friends over the last couple of years and he speaks very highly of, of you guys. And so just for the listeners, again, like I was telling you, it's a bunch of dads, uh, maybe even some grandfathers, uh, just Christian men who are trying to be better leaders, trying to live for God, trying to lead their families the right way. But this is an interesting perspective because I'm bringing on teenagers, right? And I'm having you guys talk about this Apogee program and all that it's doing for you. And I think it's going to be cool for dads to hear how encouraging the future of our next generation is. So that's why you're here. Um, what is, so tell me, so you, tell me again where you're from, tell me your age, and then if you have any siblings and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm 17. Um, I live in Tennessee from Colorado. Um, and I'm a only child. It's just uh, me and my mom. So, you know, it, we do a lot of stuff together. And that's how it's been for um, a long time. And, you know, we are lucky enough to have come across these programs. But um, really, uh, my mom is my like number one, number one support system that I have. That's that's so good. And and I will add to that. So the good thing about Apogee is that you're going to have a bunch more other people in your support system as well uh, as this goes. But do you play sports? I do play sports. Um, I played uh, basketball, um, football, and baseball, um, each for little bits of time between um, eighth grade, freshman year, sophomore year. Um, currently, I do jiu-jitsu. I'm a blue belt in jiu-jitsu. And nice. I do wrestling and looking more towards, you know, trying out more martial arts. I did karate growing up. So I've always mm -hmm. been in martial arts. Um, but my main focus right now is jujitsu. That's great. That's good. I know that's one of the main staples in, in Apogee as far as fitness goes. And uh, that's awesome, dude. I wish I'd have known about it when I was your age. And so it's cool that you're doing that and that you're doing wrestling. Those, those will never go out of style and being good at those will never get old and it'll, it'll never be a waste of your time. Um, well, that's cool. Cause you get another bonus point. Cause I'm an only child. Uh, so there we go. We're already best friends. Um, all right. So we do something kind of fun and, uh, I call it life sentence. And 
you're not you're not going away. It's not you haven't done anything illegal, but you've got a life sentence here, and and we're gonna you're gonna finish the sentence. And I gave these are the identical to what I gave the other guys. So I think it's just gonna be cool to hear different perspectives, and and they might be the same answer, it might be similar, but all right, start with this one. They're super easy. Um, okay, the thing I'm starting to learn most about leadership is thing i'm learning most about leadership uh your actions matter more than your words and i think that's a big thing um especially with matt and apogee um we talk a lot about not just talking about it but being about it and letting your actions match the things that you're saying and the more that you know i grow and i'm looking at other men and looking at other people in the program, looking at people around me and, you know, seeing that a lot of people have uh, different sides of them. You know, there's the social media side that's like, this is actually what I think or you know, what I think people should think, I think. Um, and then there's how I actually behave or, you know, how I am around a certain group of people versus how I am around a different group of people. And something that Mr. Baudreau actually says a lot is like when as a parent, your kids will do what you do before they do what you say. And I think, you know, all of that ties together is just being like, you could tell me, you know, the best advice in the world. Um, but your credibility is based on if you're actually doing that thing. And you know, as far as leadership goes, I would be more inclined to follow somebody that their words and actions match because that I think adds to their integrity yep. and how mm -hmm. much you can trust that person. Yeah. I was going to say the word, I was going to bring it up if you didn't, but yeah, that the, the higher your integrity, the narrower that gap is between what you do and what you say. Right. In fact, there should not be a gap. And so that's very cool. And I mean, if you want to own your own business someday, nobody wants to hire somebody that makes all the promises, right? And can't deliver. So yes, that's a big one. Um, all right. Well, you're on the right track here. Let's see what else we can do here and see if we can't confuse you a little bit. You don't seem easily shaken. Uh, us only children are, are gifted like that. Um, yeah. All right. So let's say you're talking to a group of kids that are considering Apogee. Okay. Maybe they're 14, 15 year old. They're not, they're not super confident. Maybe they don't have a ton of friends. Maybe they, you know, they've been homeschooled. Let's just say, I'm just drawing a hypothetical, but they're not sure. Okay. They hear about it, but they don't know. They're kind of scared. What do you say to somebody that's considering Apogee, but just doesn't really know if it's for them? I think it's not so much, you know, if, if I'm trying to convince somebody, I don't think it's so much that Apogee isn't for certain people as much as certain people are not for Apogee because Apogee can be beneficial to everybody that comes into it. Wow. Any wow. young man that's going to, you know, walk through the doors and be able to come in and interact with us and interact with the mentors and stick around for their year of time. And after um, there's a return on that, no matter what, because however you're living your life you're putting yourself in a position with you know successful people who have already made the mistakes who are going to come in and tell you hey this is where i messed up this is where i learned this is what works this is what works for me um and i think you know that's important to note it's not so much the program itself for people is the, the people for the program. Um, but, you know, what I would say is if you're willing, you know, to put in the time, you're going to see a drastic change in yeah. yourself. And, you know, it's going to be difficult and it's going to feel weird and out of place at first. But if, you know, you want to be somebody who stands out among your peers and somebody who can leave you know, what we say high school gets to that 17, 18, 19 years old, somebody who gets to that age and has an idea of where they're going and can, you know, develop and lean on a set of morals and standards and, you know, not go out and be like, hey, I'm going to 
party because I don't know what else I'm going to do with my life. Like if you are willing to focus on and develop those things by the time you're in your early twenties, when everybody else is just figuring out what they want to do with their life, you're already going to be set up. You're going to be halfway there. Um, and you know, I think all of those things are important to know, especially for people that aren't sure. But that being said, people, not everybody wants to come in and do the things that are asked of them. Mm-hmm. You know, some people don't always want that. And it's important to note that, you know, everybody it's, you know, everybody is not going to end up with the same outcome because the outcome is based on your input. Yeah, I, I would, I mean, a hundred percent, the way you worded the part of, it's not necessarily a question of whether Apogee is for somebody, but somebody is for Apogee. Like, I, I love that. And I know somebody will love to hear that. I know his name's Matt Bavdro. He'll love to hear that one. Um, so the last one here for life sentences, um, I want you to complete this sentence. The thing that encourages me most about my generation and the future is um the thing that encourages me most i think would be the potential i think a lot of young people are uh counted out and you know like you're not old enough to do this you have to wait you know to start a business to learn how to drive to do all these things and then you know they're hitting that 18 19 year old year old gap again and they should be starting to get to the point where they're figuring things out for themselves and they don't have a driver's license. They've never worked a job. And now instead of getting to that point and having a general direction, they're just now figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the same can be said, you know, with uh, academia and like shaming kids in school for failing instead of being like, Hey, you know, this is, this is where we learn. And I think a lot of kids have, potential and i think a lot of kids and young people um would love the opportunity for something like apogee something that teaches them how to be better and now uh, i think a lot of young people would seize that opportunity yeah agreed so tell me a little bit about the apogee program so far how long have you been in it maybe um something that has made you better from it like something that you've noticed a change in yourself because of it. Um, so I joined Apogee um, a little over two years ago, November of 2021. Um, so I've, I've been in for a little over two years. Obviously you're the program is about a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get to the end and then, you know, if you do, I don't want to say what's asked of you. It's not Mm -hmm. like, you know, we're not getting graded, but you know, if you're showing up, you're putting in the work and you're growing and being intentional about, you know, the interactions and things that you're having with people, uh, you can stay. So I have chosen to stay. Um, I still do mentor calls. And um, so it's been a little over two years. I, I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed coming out of Apogee is just the desire to have morals and standards, because I think, you know, the concept of having morals and standards is like, yeah, of course I would never, you know, smoke weed. Of course. Right. Yeah. Until you do, because that's not a decision that you really made. That's just like, I would never do that. Um, and throughout Apogee, it's always pushed like, hey, are you thinking about this thing? Have you thought about, you know, what you would do in this situation? Is this the right thing to do? Um, I also think that it's because I have pride in what Apogee is and I want to represent. Right? Yeah. I want to represent Apogee. Yeah. I want to represent Mr. Bodro. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things. And I think the second thing is definitely humility. I think when I first started the program, there was a lot of things um, that would pop up and I was like, 
man, I don't like, I don't really know if this is beneficial to me and would kind of write the situation off. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think as mm -hmm. time has gone on, I've understood more like, Hey, I don't understand everything. I don't know everything. Um, like there was a lot of things that I would come in and, you know, like I, I wasn't sure if it applied to me and I, it was almost like a sense of defiance of being like, mm. you know, this guy's telling me something, but he doesn't know me. Um, and that's quickly faded. I mean, I, I, go into every call like man i can take something away from this dude and i do mm -hmm. that applies everywhere that applies yeah. to training and jujitsu and relationships and anything else um yeah. so i think you know that's been super important for me to learn over the years too yeah and and, and that that's for everybody like it's not, it's yeah. not just for you guys yeah. being young people that that's for older people like me like we need to always stay humble or, or life will humble you. You ready for the job interview? Cause we're going to, we're going to put that hat on now. And, and now I'm going to be the hiring manager. Okay. And you're coming in and there's, I know there's quite a few people that are applying for this job and you're having to sell yourself. Okay. Um, I've got to find the it factor in somebody. And I don't know if you know what that is, but the it factor, like this thing that maybe is intangible, maybe it's tangible, but something that can't be coached. Maybe it's something unique about that person, something that's going to drive them to be different. What is that about you that would make me want to choose you over those other people? I think my it factor would be my work ethic and my, um, my desire to work for you and not just for myself. Um, I think that a lot of times people get in a job only looking for what they can get out of it and you know i would enter this job thinking you know how can i help you because that's what i'm here to do i'm here to help you with your service um and the work ethic that i can bring you know i can be here on time i can stay late if it's needed um but, but i think the the energy and the uh, the the energy and the work ethic that I can bring to your workplace, I don't think can be matched by any of your other people. Okay, good. All right. Uh, well, how about, I got a couple things I want you to maybe rank in order of importance. So let's say if of these three things, I want you to pick the one that maybe least motivates you and the one that maybe most motivates you. Okay. Rather than having you go one, two, three, let me just give you the three and then you pick what is most motivating, least motivating. Here you go. First would be pay. So income, bonuses, I don't know, commission incentives, those kinds of contests where you could win like money. Okay, let's just say income. Second one is respect and recognition of either your peers or your boss. That's the other one. The last one is time off vacation, maybe a free half day. If you do something right, we send, you know, we like, Hey, take off the rest of the day. So time off respect and recognition from your peers or your boss or income go time off. I think would be the least important thing. I think respect is definitely important. Pay is definitely important. Um, money is a tool and respect can be earned. The time off, I think, I mean, time off is great, right? Um, but it's not a necessity. Um, okay. Respect is going to transfer. You know, if you know somebody who knows somebody, um, mm -hmm. of course, I'm going to want, I'm, I'm going to want to make sure that I'm putting myself in the best position as possible. On top of that, um, be seen as somebody who is leaving people better off having known me. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think um respect would be the most important um pay can be you know earned more pay can be earned based on that respect uh time off is not a necessity okay that's good i like it uh, that is good and and just so you know the other guys i think had time off as the last one also 
So uh, I think they had respect and recognition actually won as well, which that's crazy. Uh, that's good. Okay. Well, um, so you, you've given me the it factor. We know what that is about you. You said work ethic, your desire to serve the company and the organization and your team uh, over yourself. That's, that's huge. Um, so we know what's good about you. We know what your strengths are, but nobody likes to talk about their weakness. What, what area would you say about yourself that needs the most improvement? See, a lot of people get kind of tripped up by this question because they think if they're talking about their shortcomings, then maybe that sets them back in the interview process. And they're like, I'm telling this guy why not to hire me, basically. And that's really not what you're doing. So I'm giving you a little help there by I asked the question for a reason. So don't get caught up in, well, if I tell him something I'm not good at, then that's going to count against me. I wouldn't go there. Um, I think definitely a place that I hit a wall a lot is a failure of or fear of fear of success. Um, and I think that's kind of a weird one to try to explain to people. But um, the best way I can explain it is like I've done a lot of jujitsu competitions. I've lost a lot of times. Um, and every time I lose, I can stand up. I can look that dude in the face, thank him, give him a hug and move on with my life and there's a lot of times where I've been in a match and I've had the opportunity to just absolutely just just win it just take it um and for whatever reason that builds up a hesitation um and that hasn't really you know bled out into anything else that I've done I'm usually pretty good about um doing what needs to be done and make sure mm -hmm. that I'm getting my job's done um but that's definitely something that i think could use some improvement so that it doesn't bleed out into other places because uh you, you know that has the hesitation that comes with like oh man is this the right decision um can be a killer in certain situations sometimes you know decisions and actions just they have to be made and actions have to be taken hmm that's interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a unique way of looking at. Um, so, and I, I'm not a therapist, but I'm just kind of curious. Like, you ever given that much thought beyond just kind of verbalizing that, like as to maybe why you aren't closing the deal in those situations, um, especially when you stand to gain from those? Uh, any idea? I have thought about it. I don't know if I've come up with a an answer that is really the answer, if that sure. makes sense. I think I've come up with things that could be possibilities. Yeah. Um, one of them being, one of them I think is like what comes from winning frequently. And I don't think it's so much the added responsibility. I don't mind having responsibilities and added things, um, but I think it's the attention. I think the attention of losing it's easier to deal with the attention of winning and i don't know exactly why that is um but um uh, it's definitely something i've given thought to i've had like i said i've had plenty of times yeah. where i've been in a yeah. position that i should have been able to close the deal and didn't do it for whatever reason i can name afterwards yeah um yeah. But that's that's definitely the hesitation um, and just, you know, the whole like paralysis by analysis of just right. thinking too much about the situation instead of just doing the thing. That's good. No, I think that's a very I mean, that's a mature way to look at it. And I would say, too, because I think I have I think we've all kind of had a version of that. And my two cents would be in, and in my life where I think have I've had that hesitation or maybe I didn't know how to handle is I think we think that all of a sudden, if we have all this success, then not only does the bar get raised, but then all these people have these expectations and then we're trying to please everybody. And I, I'm, I like to please people of course, but then I don't like to disappoint them either. But I think if we just all kind of sit back and think, you know what, I'm not so worried about what everyone else thinks about this. Like I'm doing this because it's good for me. I'm doing it because I like the competition and I'm doing it because it makes me stronger. 
And if I, if I tune out all the noise and the attention and the people, and I don't worry about the outcome, I'll, you know, obviously I want to win or it wouldn't be called a competition. Um, so then I close the deal and all of a sudden I've won. I don't really care what everybody else says. Like I know in my heart I did it and I put in the work and that was the outcome. Like the fruit of your labor, of all the training, all the practice, the sweat, the pain, dude, that's for something. So when you're in that situation, don't hesitate. Close the deal, walk away from it, drown out the noise, but know internally, dude, that was worth it. Like, well, all that work was worth because of that moment right there. So that's my encouragement to you. You didn't ask for it, but that's my podcast. So I gave it to you. Um, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate the different perspective because i mean obviously as much as i can think about it you, yeah. you're gonna think a different way and, we've all yeah we've all know. been there trust me you're not alone that's the other thing the enemy likes to lie to us and tell us like you're the only one dealing with this i would keep it to yourself and never never tell anybody about it and you're weak because you feel this way and nobody else does like i i've heard those voices so don't believe that lie all right now we got off tangent there because I, I took off the, the interviewer hat and put on the podcast hat again. And then now I'm back interview hat again. Okay. All right. All right I'm going to give you a scenario. Okay. And then we'll wrap it up. But there's a scenario for this job interview I want to give you. And, and it's between you and another person. Uh, let's say you get hired and you're on the team. And then I, I appoint two of you to take the lead on a project for the rest of the group. And doesn't really matter what the project is. The fact that you guys have different viewpoints and ideas on what to do to accomplish this project, they're totally different. A, some conflict could arise. Um, you obviously disagree, so we're not seeing eye to eye on this, you and this person. How do you handle a situation like that? And if if conflict does arise, like how do you handle a differing of opinion, differing of idea, disagreement, conflict, that situation? How do you in that situation, how do you deal with that to actually come up with a solution? I think civil discourse is the first place to start, right? Because we could have different numbers, but if I'm willing to be like, hey, um, you know, this is where I disagree, this is why. I mean, this is the proof of what I'm saying, and we still disagree. You know, there's things that can be done after that, but I think the conversation has to happen first. It can't just be, we have separate plans, so, you know, this guy sucks at his job. Mm -hmm. There can be a, mm -hmm. hey, let's compare notes. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you're wrong. Let's figure it out. If we still disagree after that, um, I think, you know, depending on the project, it could be, taken to a taken to a third party maybe not the management because the management passes the assignment down so that they don't have to worry about it so maybe the next step is bringing it up to whoever this team of people is hey we have these two ideas what do you guys think this is you know this is why i think this one will work this is why i think this other one will work maybe that's the next maybe that's the next step um yeah. i can, you know i can see where the conflict would come if for whatever reason, it kept being that a decision wasn't made. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think prior to the conflict coming up, there can be discussions with between the two people. There could be discussions with the team. Um, there could be a, any other person, maybe somebody in the same position as you on a different project. Um, there's a lot of ways that that can be handled prior to the conflict. That was, that was good. Like I, I nobody answered the question that way. Um, and that you were going like where I was thinking in my head. So the fact that you said, because my next follow up was going to be, when do you involve the manager? And you went there without me asking that because you said he doesn't have time to mess with that. Like, let's involve a third party. Like, I was thinking the words third party when you said it. So, like, so that wraps up the interview. And now we're back to being who we are. Um, it was, it was a pleasure to get to know you. Uh, do you have any kind of final words for, I don't know, the audience? I mean, I, I don't know if your mom might listen to this. I'm you're, you're obviously your apogee brothers and, uh, might listen to this. So I don't know. Do you have any encouragement for just teenagers out there right now that are kind of in the same boat as you? 
whatever you think might encourage, if you're talking to somebody like you, what do you think they need to hear? Be, be somebody that's worth being proud of. Like be, be somebody, make sure you're living your day to day as, you know, somebody that leaves people better off. Right. Make sure you're, you're living as somebody who you would be proud of, you know, your parents or whoever else you look up to seeing, you know, and that goes back to the, how we were talking about integrity and yeah. your actions matching your words. Um, and beyond that, um, like make sure that uh, for men specifically, like make sure you're the kind of person that you would be okay with your daughter dating. Mm -hmm. Right. And make sure you're the kind of person that you want your future wife to be attracted to, like always be thinking about who you are and what your role is, because you don't really get to choose, you know, if you're influential, you're going to be influential to everybody you come in contact with. So if, you know, you can control if you're going to be a good influence or a bad influence. And beyond that, the integrity and confidence that you can not not even prove to other people, like the integrity aspect, but the respect and confidence you can build for yourself, knowing day to day, like, hey, I'm proud of the things I did today. I'm proud of how I handled these situations. Um, I think that would take a lot of people in a different direction if they thought about, hey, you know, what if my kids saw this what if my you know this guy that i looked up to saw these things i'm doing that would change a lot of people's actions and i think that would be um for the better but that's that's kind of what i would say like make sure you're leaving things in a in a way that is better than you found it i agree 100 percent, and i have nothing to add to that thank you <laughs> for saying all that audience I have nothing else to add. That was that was pretty good. So audience, he's been Malachi Duncan. We've been last in line. Be blessed.